Welcome to the Florist Age Podcast, a place where we help you create a life you're excited about. This week, we are going to talk about codependency. Yay! (laughs) Some of you might be going, all right, I'm checking out. I encourage you to stick around because codependency impacts so many people. Now, I've spoken about this in my book at length. If you've downloaded the bonus chapter from my book um, on my website, uh, you've heard a lot more of my story. And if you checked out episode 34 here on the podcast, um, you heard a little bit about how I discovered I was codependent. So today I'm going to share a little bit more about my discovery of codependency, the resources that I used to help recover from codependency and what I do now to maintain my recovery of codependency. So bless you. My dog just sneezed. (laughs) He's laying right next to me sleeping. Okay. So you may remember from episode 34 that I was having lunch with a new friend of mine and this was after my third divorce, after I swore off therapy and self-help and relationship help. I'm like, nope, I'm done. I'm not going to retell that story. But in any case, we were having lunch and she's like, you do realize you're codependent, right? And I was like, what? So I, I looked it up. What is codependency? I found a website called CODA, C-O-D-A, and I took this little quiz, this little questionnaire that they had, and I realized I was codependent. And I was like, oh my God, yes, I'm so excited. And she's like, what? I've never heard anybody excited to be codependent. I'm like, you don't understand. Now I know how to fix my shit. Now I know how to fix my relationships. And so in digging into codependency, I realized that there's two types of codependence. There is the overt and the covert. So the covert is the chameleon. These are the people that don't say anything when they're when somebody uh, slights them, when somebody crosses their boundaries, um, because they don't want to ruffle feathers. They don't want to upset anybody. That was who I was. I legit was the covert codependent. Then you have the overt codependent that does the passive aggressive stuff, that does the you will do this or else. They do the gaslighting. They do all of these things that make you feel like shit and make you feel like that you have no choice but to comply with what that person is saying. I used to think that the overts were the ones that used to manipulate. Well, you you need to do this or else. And it was a form of manipulation. And the, the passive aggressive bullshit that we all hate, um, that's a form of manipulation. Well, the thing that I didn't realize was that not saying something is also a form of manipulation. And I was like, oh shit. Like my ex-husband was a narcissistic sociopath Um, As per our therapist, um, that's not my diagnosis, that is hers. And um, so being in a codependent with a narcissistic sociopath was hell. It was absolute hell. And that's why when I learned effective communication, well, effective communication with a sociopathic, narcissistic, codependent, overt codependent, Um, is hell. Being very communicative is not a good thing because then it, it increases the gaslighting. It increases the sarcastic, uh, remarks that really are designed to cut you down and butcher your self-confidence and self-worth. So when I started to dig in and learn these two aspects of codependency, the overt versus the covert. And I realized that I just, I hated that my ex-husband was so manipulative and so this and so that. And then I realized, oh shit, like I am the same way. I'm just being covert about it. That was a come to Jesus moment. That was a moment where I was like, oh my gosh. So when I, when I don't say anything to someone because I don't want to ruffle feathers, I'm manipulating that person because they're not getting all the information, okay? 
So if, if somebody crosses your boundary, let's just say, and you don't like it, but you don't tell that person that they've crossed a boundary, they're just going to keep doing it because they don't know they've crossed a boundary. Sometimes they know, and if they know their boundaries or your boundaries and they keep crossing over them, then they're just a jerk and that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> But when, you know, by not saying something, you're manipulating the situation because they don't have all the information at hand. They don't have all the information. And if they had all the information, then they may modify their behavior around you and towards you, hopefully, so that it's healthier. So in any case, that was the biggest aha moment that I had right out of the gate. And I was like, oh shit. So I learned to, even though it was really, really uncomfortable, I learned to start to speak up and speak my truth, even though my voice shook, even though sometimes um, it felt really, really awkward, it worked. It worked. I said, you know, I don't like when you do this. This makes me uncomfortable. All of a sudden, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Thank you for telling me. 99% of the people that I spoke my truth to were absolutely respectful. They honored it and they were like, thank you so much for letting me know. The 1% turned pissed, upset, gaslighting, all that stuff. That clued me into, okay, so this person is the overt codependent and they don't like when I'm speaking up. And that's the thing that you're going to start to see is those narcissistic, sociopathic people or overt codependent. Now, these are not interchangeable, okay? There are people that are narcissistic only. There are people that are sociopathic only. There are people that are just overt codependents. Um, I just happen to have an experience with someone who was all three. And um, if you don't know what a narcissist is, Google it. If you don't know what a sociopath is, Google it. Um, you're gonna be in for a huge awakening. And, um, but in any case, so allowing myself to really recognize those two types of codependent traits was absolutely huge. So I started to commit to reading. So after my relapse, okay, let me back up for a second. So discovered codependency, went to a meeting, got a bunch of literature, discovered the two different types of codependence, and I was like, whoa. And then I'm like, yeah, I don't need to go through the steps. I'm good. I was totally intellectualizing it. Um, I relapsed, had a one night stand, and was like, fuck, I don't want to be this person. Um, so I actually committed to reading the literature, going through the steps, and going to meetings every single week. And when I did the steps, I did it, I'm like, if I'm gonna do this, I am going to do this. Um, I have a ton of resources that I'm going to post in the um, show notes. It's a lot, but this is exactly what I did. So there's an online fellowship for recovery. It's called intherooms.com. It works best in your Chrome browser, but this is how I attended meetings. And I still will pop in from time to time to do a meeting. Sometimes I'll share, sometimes not. But uh, In The Rooms is an online recovery network for people that identify with any fellowship. So it could be AA, NA, MA, SA, SLAA, um, CODA, um, all the different types of anonymous groups. Highly, highly, highly recommend, especially in today's society where we have COVID and other things going around. It's really nice to be able to attend meetings. Now you can have this truly be anonymous to where you don't have your name, you don't have your image. You can pick a random name, you can pick a random image, and then for meetings, you do not have to show your face, you do not even have to turn on your uh, video. So it's super nice, super, super, super anonymous. <laughs> And it's so beneficial because when you're in a meeting, you truly can hear people all over the spectrum. You can hear people that it is their first meeting and their first realization that they're codependent. And then all the way up to people who are in recovery, who have healthy, thriving relationships and who offer 
promises of hope, like keep going, I promise it gets better. And you hear everybody's messy middle and you realize that you're not alone and you also hear things that people have done that have worked for them and you can kind of put those in your back pocket for uh, for you to possibly try in the future. So along with the meetings, like I said, I also did uh, four books that I worked through the steps. Now, like I said, I was like, I just, I'm, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this the right way. So, so I got the 12 step handbook. I got the big blue book. I got the 12 step workbook for codependency. And I got the codependence guide to the 12 steps by Melanie Beatty. All of these links are going to be in the show notes. And so what I did was on, for all four of these books, I read step one in the 12 step handbook. And then I went to the blue book and read step one. Then I went to the 12 step workbook. I did all of those questions and did step one in that book. And then the codependence guide to the 12 steps, I did step one in that book and I answered all the questions. I did that with each step and I only did one step at a time in each one of those books. And it took me almost, it took me just at around seven months to do all 12 steps. And I gotta tell you, some of the steps were really, really easy. Step four was the hardest because step four is when you literally say, this is all my shit, okay? Um, And then step five is when you share your step four. So this is someone who typically doesn't know you. Uh, They're typically someone who has been through the 12 steps of your fellowship, in this case for codependency. I spent two Fridays at a local bread company having lunch and sharing my step five with a fellow codependent. And it was so eye-opening and so refreshing and so freeing. I just can't even tell you how exhilarating it was. One of the other things that I did to enhance the step work was I did these 12-step PDF worksheets Um, from a group down in Tulsa. And again, I'm posting all of this information in the show notes. Um, This is under the heading 12-step PDF worksheets. And there's five of them. There's the 12-step main PDF hub. And then there's the 12 steps with Melanie Beatty, childhood, adolescence for step four, and then some additional questions. And again, like I said, (laughs) I was not going to half-ass this work. I was like, I'm done being codependent. I'm done having shitty relationships. Let's do this. And like I said, this is one of the reasons why it took me seven months. After I finished my 12 steps, I kept going to the meetings and sharing every single week. After about a year and a half, I asked myself, I'm like, you know, I don't know if I'm getting any better or not because I'm literally living in a bubble. <laughs> I'm, I've done the work. I'm going to meetings, but I'm not in a relationship. And like I said, my, my codependency traits typically reared its ugly head in intimate relationships. And so I'm like, hmm, okay. So then I'm like, I think I'm ready to start dating again. So fast forward a couple weeks, my sister hooked me up with this guy she worked with. We started dating for a couple months and it was great, but there was a couple things that I was like, "Mm, I don't know if I really resonate with these particular things. But like I said, like for the most part, it was like probably 85% of our relationship was awesome. It was really, really good. We super connected on like so many different levels. But there was about 15% of the relationship that I was like, "Mm, can I live like this for the rest of my life? And I said, no. And so I broke up with the person. And he goes, I don't understand. We're like so good together. And I'm like, we are. However... There's these few things that I I don't want and can't live with for the rest of my life. So I'm breaking up with you. And he was so confused. And I'm like, and I was very tactful, very respectful, but he still didn't understand. And again, I tried to explain it. And um, and then we we went our separate ways. He finally understood um, and all was well in the world. And... I was very proud of myself because the old codependent me would have stayed because he is such a great person and we did have such an amazing connection. But 
like I said, those couple of things that just were red flags for me that I knew I couldn't live with for the rest of my life, I knew that I had to leave the relationship. Even though it was good, it wasn't great. That's how I knew I was better. I was like, yes. Well, then I was like, okay, I don't want to get cocky. I don't want to like just think I'm better and then that's it and never check in with myself and all that jazz. So every single Sunday, I have a reminder on my phone. When I see that reminder, I stop, I check in with myself and allow myself to review the steps review how I'm doing, review my current relationship. And the current relationship that I have is literally the best, most healthiest relationship I have ever been in. So I promise you, when you go through the 12 steps, when you go through and you do the work, you can't intellectualize the steps. You truly have to go in and dig in and do the steps. When you do the steps and you get that support through meetings and whatnot, Life gets better. Life gets better. And you gain tools of communication. You gain tools of understanding. You gain tools of introspection. You gain so many different tools that help you in your current relationships like, like nothing has ever helped you before. I mean, it's, it's almost mind-blowing. And Through going through the 12 steps, it has allowed me to truly feel free in my relationships and to truly feel like I can handle whatever life throws at me because I know I'm going to be okay. Uh, They do recommend that if you are in recovery to not have a partner for the first year. Some people recognize that they're in codependent relationships while they're in a relationship. And if you feel that that is the case, and you feel that your partner is willing to work the steps with you, um, I would recommend doing it. However, typically, if you're in a codependent relationship, one is the overt and one is the covert. And typically, the overt codependent is the one that gleans a lot of benefit because they have typically the most power and control over the other person. So it is and can be challenging if you have a partner who is the overt. Now, if you are the overt codependent and the one that does the passive aggressive eye roll and the and things like that, give yourself permission to just stop. Give yourself permission to own your form of manipulation. And if you are the covert, the someone that doesn't say anything, that doesn't want to ruffle feathers, that doesn't want to have an awkward conversation, You truly need to also get over yourself. You need to speak up respectfully and have faith in the person that you're in partnership with, okay? So this is no place for ego. This truly is a place for you to decide, do I really want a healthy relationship or do I still want to just stay stuck in my bullshit? Really. And, you know, codependency is a learned trait. I learned it from my mom. My mom was very, very judgmental. She was the overt codependent. When I saw my mom judge people, I was like, oh shit, I do not want her to judge me that way. And so I started to try to conform and be that chameleon and be that person who I thought she wanted me to be so that she would love me. And that's how I learned to be a chameleon. That's how I learned to not say anything if what she said didn't make sense to me or crossed over my boundaries or was just rude or whatever. I just didn't say anything. I did not say anything. And then with my dad's second wife, um, you've all read my book. Hopefully you know the story. Um, It was hell. It was hell. And I could not... I could not say anything because if I did, all hell broke loose. And that was, it was a safety thing. It was, it was, it was a survival tactic for me so that I could feel safe or somewhat safe in my environment because I knew if I spoke up, all hell was going to break loose and I was probably going to get locked in my room again. And, you know, it was one of those things is that when you recognize that, wait a minute, I'm an adult now. I'm in my own home. Hopefully you are safe. If you're not safe, please, please find some resources. Please 
get safe somehow, some way, but really allow yourself to recognize that, okay, I'm an adult now and I can choose to learn how to communicate. I can choose to learn how to be respectful in my communication. I can choose to own my part in my relationships, but I can also choose to call somebody out on a boundary that they're crossing that is not okay with me. And that's the beautiful thing about going through the steps of codependency, going through and and finding support and going to those meetings and, and really giving yourself the opportunity to have a healthy relationship. And yeah, going through recovery is scary as hell because um, you're speaking up. You're, you're saying, I don't like this. And if you're the overt, you're keeping your mouth shut or you're not doing that passive aggressive thing. And I would find myself anytime somebody did this passive aggressive thing, I would shut down even further. And that drives a wedge between you and the other person. If you feel that you are codependent, if you feel that your relationships, and not just intimate relationships, but relationships with others, it could be a boss, a coworker, a subordinate, it could be, um, it just depends. I mean, some, some, some businesses have like the hierarchy, whether it's the boss, the manager, the subordinate, blah, blah, blah. So I remember one time I asked my boss what the chain of command was for um, work. And he goes, we don't really have like a chain of command or like a tree of whatever. He's like, it's more like a bush. <laughs> like everybody's kind of in the same boat. And it, this is an open door policy. And I... Loved it. I loved it. And it was such a great, beautiful example of powerful leadership. So in any case, I say all that to say this. When you can own your ability to speak up tactfully, when you can own your ability to keep your mouth shut, if you know that your intention behind it is to manipulate someone and focus on why you're doing the things that you're doing, what happens is all of a sudden your relationships start to get richer and deeper and better than ever before. So as I mentioned in the show notes, there is a ton of resources. Click on them, dig into them, check them out and give yourself permission to really get honest about your codependent traits. If you identify as a codependent, Uh, Look at if you feel that you are the overt or the covert. Again, the overt is the one that speaks up that you will do this or else. The covert is the one that does not speak up, that keeps their mouth shut, that doesn't want to ruffle feathers. And again, this is a learned behavior. This is a safety mechanism that we use to stay or, or hopefully feel safe in the environment that we are in. And this can happen over time. You don't have to have grown up in a codependent relationship or in a codependent environment in order for you to be codependent. This can happen in adulthood. Typically, it happens when there is some type of addiction. And um, in my case, my my mom was just like a, a raging overt codependent. And then when she passed away, my dad married someone who was a fan of the bottle. Um, And so let's just say that there was a lot of things that she did not remember the next morning. And there was a lot of things that we had to do a certain way or else. And it was just not, not a safe environment, not a, not an environment where someone could truly thrive, at least from my perspective and my experience and vantage point from that environment. You know, I was one of many in that environment and Um, so in any case, I really hope that this helps you. If you have any questions for me about my codependency recovery, please ask them, send them to support at florisage.com. Make sure that you put podcast question about codependency or however you want to put it, but make sure that you put something about the podcast in here so that that gets routed to my podcast folder, um, from my team. And I will add it to a list of questions that I get. And as soon as I have a good list, then I will do another episode about codependency and the FAQs that I'm getting from all of you. So I love you guys. Thank you so much for showing up today for yourself. 
And again, I would love to support you inside the One Degree Shift Tribe. Click the link in the show notes, join us, You will get coaching and support every single day to help you create a life that you're excited about. And for those of you wondering, this type of clutter is the mental, emotional, and spiritual type of clutter. All right, I love you and I'll see you in the next episode. If you're enjoying this content, which I hope you are, and you're applying this knowledge in your life, and are seeing results, I would love to hear about your successes. Click the link in today's show notes, share your success story with me so you can help to inspire others. Also, if you've been loving these episodes, it would mean the world to me if you would rate this podcast on iTunes. A five-star rating is what I always aim for. Thank you for listening to today's podcast episode. All links mentioned are in today's show notes.